Okay, racer fans, you might recognize this guy to my left, Robert Unser, three-time Indy 500 winner. Uh, we're at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum, and we're going to take a tour of the Unser family's great runs at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Okay, Uncle Bobby, 1968, the Eagle versus the Turbines, your first IndyCar victory. Tell all our viewers here something about this Eagle that nobody knows, that you've never told anybody before, or something that's really kind of cool that only a few people know. I had a little trick with this car that made it faster than all the other ones, because Gurney, Gurney made the car, <clears throat> excuse me, and it, it, it was good, but not super good. Then I figured out how to make it good, one day kind of just screwing around. And ironically, it's still done right now, the sway bar. The anti-roll bar in the front has got three more turns in the right front than it does the left. And nobody ever figured that out but, but me and my two mechanics. We only had two instead of 500. Red and Judd? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Red and Judd, that's it. So what is, tell the people here and tell the mechanical idiots like me, what does that do? What did that do? Well, what it does is it loads the right front and loads the left rear. And a lot of people that have watched races on, you know, sprint car midget races, and they see the guy carrying the inside left front tire around the corner, it's what I did here. I just made it like a sprint car or midget because that makes it like a live axle and, and preloads it because they didn't make a sway bar any bigger than that. And there was no room to put it in anyway. And, and so what I did is one day I just had a little red preloaded. I'm sitting in the cockpit trying to figure out what I'm gonna do to go a little bit faster. It wasn't feeling really good. And so I just, as a hunch, told little red, I said, run that right front out three turns. And it's left and right hand thread, top and bottom. A little hard, I guess, for some people to understand, but I did that and I went out on the track and there was the first 170 mile an hour lap in history here. I just gonna say, we got a billboard with you going 170 miles an hour. So after you ran 170, did anybody come flock around you and look at your car or did they just say, oh, that's Hunter, he's brave, he's crazy? Nobody had, nobody had the sense to do it. You know, when it was sitting in front of my garage over there one day, the engine was out, Judd was overhauling the engine, and it, it had nothing. In other words, without the engine in it, that wasn't some of the frame in those days, but it's almost the same. And a guy walks up, another guy in the garage, and he puts his, his uh, foot on the left front tire, and he almost fell down. The tire was spinning. <laughs> and he was just sitting on flat ground. And the guy says, geez, he said, you got to fix that. He said, you get that fixed, you really go fast. <laughs> All right, so it was the best car up to that point in your career, which started in 1963. This was the best car you ever drove. Yes, for sure. Okay, Mr. Unser, in 1972, when you shattered the Indianapolis Motor Speedway record by 17 miles an hour, it's, this wasn't the car. This is the car you won the 75 Indy 500 in, but it's, it's basically the car that, that, that established the record and, and took, took off. What's the modifications from 72 to your 75 winning car? What was the difference? There wasn't a heck of a lot. The cars were really, really, really similar. The wings are different, and ah, that's, that's different for sure. Front wing, you can see it's a two, on each side, two wings. Right. And, and other than that, the car's basically the same. But the engine made more power. That's John Miller. A lot you of You kept power. telling him to turn on the boost. Oh, geez, he could... I mean, what do you think you had, Bobby, the most power you had at Indy in, in, in the early 70s? Well, we know we were just under 1,200 horsepower, 1,100 <laughs> and some odd horsepower. It's been the friggin' tires coming off a four turn down there, number four or number two. I mean, I could go around the next lap and see where I was. And then, and then be black rubber marks that that thing's making. Now, nobody, it had a turbocharger on there now. Ah, Al, my brother, and Parnelli would like to think it was a cheater. But it wasn't. The it turbo? Was illegal. Yeah. It was totally legal. The problem is they never had brains enough to go down to the turbo factory <laughs> and order one like it. <laughs> but it made probably another, I'd say it probably made at least another 150 horsepower, wow. you know? Wow. I mean, that thing was so friggin' fast you couldn't believe it. I, I mean, I just remember you telling me the first time you tested it in Ontario, or the first couple times, Dan had to tell you to slow. He didn't want you to go 200 miles an hour, right? Because... There was no well, publicity. He wanted to have you guys there. He wanted the press to be there. And he just, he just absolutely got me aside and said, please, 
don't do it now. <laughs> I said, boss, I got it. I can give it to you right now. It's in my hand. I can go. I can give you the first 200 mile an hour in history, anywhere in the world. I can do it. Yeah. And, and he says, please don't do it now, you know. Did you know 15, 20, 30 laps into the first time you drove this thing, it was the best, the, that Eagle, the 72 Eagle, and its modification was the best car you ever drove? No, we had problems with it in the beginning. Ironically, the, the rear end suspension, I, I wouldn't have enough time if I took probably six months to explain it to people and have them understand how it works. But you can make some small adjustments to like the rear end, mm -hmm. and it'll make the car handle totally different. And, uh, and I, I was out there in the car, and we just can, we can get up like, like to 190, and that's about all we could hack it, you know. High 180s, this is in Ontario, just like in Indianapolis. And pretty soon, you know, I'm back down to the shop and asked Wayne Leary, my chief mechanic then, I says, something different on the rear end from last year. Roman Slobodinsky. Yep. See, that's what people can understand. Slow body, that. baby. Yeah. And he'd, he'd always tell me the rear end's exactly the same as it was the year before. So I got down to the shop and got Wayne and Dean and Butch together, and I said, come on, guys, what's different on the rear end? Let's, let's do some measuring. I didn't have another car to measure against. So Wayne told me that the, the roll center was a little bit different. Oh, excuse me, the camber curve was a little bit different on the rear than it had been the year before. I said, you've got to be kidding me. Roman told me it was exactly the same. So now if he, if he doesn't tell me right, I don't know where to start working. Right. And so I told Wayne, I says, you guys got to come down here after night. Can you put us uh, the year before rear end, totally the geometry under the car, exactly the same. No more talk about it. Make it exactly as it was last year and leave the front end as it is now. He says, we can do that. But he says, yeah, we'll get in trouble if Dan catches us. <laughs> I says, well, do it at night. <laughs> they never left till 10 o'clock at night anyway. <laughs> so they'd come back at 1030 and start to work. And they changed it. And I went in and talked to the head guy doing the fabrication and asked him if he'd help on this. Got to get it done. Can't let Dan know about it because Dan really get upset and did it to the car, and I won't bother you with the story because it would take too long, and because Dan caught us about 15 minutes, 20 minutes before we got the thing on the track of what we had done. He was really upset. And so he could tell by just looking at it? No, we had to kind of confess a little <laughs> bit. You know, we weren't okay. ready to go on the racetrack, so well, we had to give Dan well, a confession. Let's fast forward to the race real quick. Of all the laps you led at Indy, which were a bunch, and all the races you should have won, you only led 11 laps when the rain came here. Did you see the rain coming? Did you have, no. the, did you have the best car that day? Yeah. Did Coach Voigt and Rutherford said, oh, we'd have blown him off. No, you well, still I don't know how the hell they were going to do it because they weren't going to do it with me there. <laughs> I had them beat by a ton. I had just made my last pit stop. Not only that, Miller put in some screws into the horsepower. I'm going to run about the latter part of that race, probably going to be about 1,050 to 1,100 horsepower. <laughs> there ain't no way those guys are going to touch me. You know? I, mean, I mean, what they're going to see is they're going to see, see an embarrassment. I mean, that Rutherford still thinks today he might have caught me. And, you know, he's one of my best friends. What is he going to catch me with? <laughs> Gun wouldn't shoot that fast. That thing is going to be gone. Uh, okay. This is your 1981 Indy 500 winner, which is still one of the prettiest race cars in IMS history. You developed it. Just tell us. You just tell us about tunnels and ground effects, and you how fastly you you adapted all that stuff. Well, it was the obviously early days of the ground effects cars underneath, so the people will understand when you go down the road, it's the same as piping air in from the front because hypothetically you're doing 200 miles an hour, so there's 200 miles an hour of air going underneath. So underneath it is like the best way to explain it, people, is fantasize it is, is another wing. That wing down there, it's going to push it into the ground. And it's all done via like, like, uh, like a carburetor, Venturi. The air goes in the front, and then about a little ways down the middle, the air really speeds up and starts sucking the car into the ground. And so that makes a giant difference. So now, 
then, then I, I designed all those tunnels underneath myself. And what I did is I took little Ronnie Dawes. Right. Took and, and made my wind, or my airflow bench into a wind tunnel. And then we even, he even made a moving ground plane for it in case these guys in England thought they were high tech, you know. We were way ahead of them. In Albuquerque. Yeah, in Albuquerque. Okay, well, let me ask you a question. You started in the Novi, a front-engine Novi, at 145 miles an hour or whatever it was. Then you end up going whatever this qualifying speed was. What made you – why were you so smart about ground effects? What, why did you know about this? You started out as just an old sprint car driver. Well, uh, that's, that's, you're absolutely right about that. Plus, I didn't go to school. <laughs> I didn't need to go to school to learn that stuff. <laughs> I mean, uh, Colin Chapman did something, right? We read about it in the books. And I think, wow, if that guy has got ground effects, what does he mean by it? So we studied a little bit, and, and pretty soon I go down to the, the, the library, and I get a Colin Chapman book. And he's not into the ground effects yet. But I read all the English guys that write articles, talk about this new technology called ground effects, sucks the car into the ground. I said, man, I want one of them things. <laughs> and so I learned about it a little bit, and we made, the, made our airflow bench into a wind tunnel. And Ronnie, of course, is a good fabricator. Yep. So he'd make them things in one-sixth scale. I'd send them overnight to Penske shop in Reading, Pennsylvania. Jerry Brown would make me a live piece. We'd head for Michigan. I'd test the car up there, and wow, we made a big gain on that one. So that gets me started. Now I start making 20 or 30 of them big gains. Pretty soon, I know what I'm doing. And I still haven't been to school for it, <laughs> but it worked. And this car was just so good like that. I mean, this car knew how to go around the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. I mean, it was just exceptionally good. All my development went that way. Wings, everything, the under, underneath of the car, even to the tub shape. I mean, we really did high-tech stuff on this car. Bobby, was, was this car more fun to drive, the fastest car, the easiest car you ever drove to victory, or was it the 75 car, or was the, is it hard to compare? With the time, yeah, hard to compare, because the time we got through with them, they were all good cars. I'm a cranky guy, so I got to give everything. <laughs> everything has to be just perfect. Otherwise, I raised too much cane. We went through a lot of testing. We became so smart on ground effect stuff, it's unbelievable. And, and aerodynamics in general. I mean, you just can't believe all the people that got so smart because of Colin Chapman, Lotus Cars. Right. But I still we think, all became smarter human beings. But I still think it's great that you and Foyt and, you know, your brother, I mean, Al really didn't start in a roadster, but you guys started in roadsters and you started at 140 miles an hour, 145, and you got all the way to 215, 220, and you adapted to that so smoothly it appeared. But just that, just that body of work, that's what impresses me most. You, you won an Indy 500 in three decades, which is, I think you're the only guy that's done it. Well, three different types of car designs. That's probably what people aren't understanding. There's a giant difference between each one of my sure. wins. And so it was new development. That's what was fun. You know, people, they, we don't have that. Now we only have spec cars. All the cars are, even though the paint jobs are different, they're all the same. And we didn't have that. In other words, I really had secrets. And I didn't have to give them to everybody. <laughs> I could go out and try out something or develop, it, develop something, and it was mine. Yeah. If I could keep it a secret, nobody would get it. And I mean, I got three cars right here. Ain't nobody got those secrets. <laughs> they probably don't know about most of them today, you know? Well, they probably don't. That's Robin. That's what makes racing so fun for me in my era. I really believe that. Sure. I mean, we... There were no, there wasn't Twitter or an internet or anything. Then we just hear how did Unser test or how did how's the new Eagle or how's the new McLaren or how's the new Penske. We didn't know. You just heard by word of mouth it was good or bad. So yeah. that had to be even more fun. Like when you enrolled at Ontario with the Eagle and you come out and you're, you know, you can almost go 200 miles an hour like that. You got to be thinking, God, I want to tell somebody about this, but I can't. I know, but you can't. <laughs> right. And like my brother Al. I mean, I look at over to his cars. I mean, all fast cars. Yeah. George Big Naughty was a smart mechanic sure too. sure but by the same token some way or another we'd outsmart them and in like with Penske I had no rules 
with Roger. He would give me everything or anything that I ever wanted. I it made no difference. If I didn't like the wheels, he changed the wheels. I, mean, I remember writing a story when you signed with Penske saying, this will never work. Unser's too bullheaded. Penske's too regimented. It'll never work. You guys got along famously. Hardly ever had an argument. I mean, we never had a fight. I mean, a couple of disagreements, and that's the most. Yeah. The man gave me anything and everything I ever wanted in a race car. And so then if I couldn't make it go fast, who am I going to blame? Right. It's me. Sure. And I just loved it. Rob and I had so much fun in that era because it, it was nice to outsmart. Sure. Like McLaren. I mean, good people. Almost drove for him one time. But it was really nice to be able for Roger Penske and Bobby Unser to get a friggin' car built and know we're going to beat the McLaren. Sure, you know? and sure. And we did, you know? All right, Unser. Thanks for taking us through this history. The Indianapolis Motor Speed Museum has done a great job again. We thank these people for letting us in here after hours to film this wonderful thing. Marshall Pruitt's doing the key, the camera work. I can't talk. Marshall's doing the camera work. Steve Shunk put this thing together. Uncle Bobby provides the history. I'm just a stooge that talks. Thanks for watching Racer.com, and check out Unser's video here soon on Racer.com. You're still the best stooge we ever had, though. Don't worry about oh, that. No, that's nice of you.